Hey everybody, it's Miss Adair, and we have chapter 31 for Stargirl, and it is now time for the Ocotillo Ball. As she had predicted, I did not ask her to the Ocotillo Ball. I did not ask anyone. I didn't go. She did. The ball took place on Saturday night in late May on the tennis courts of the Mica Country Club. When the sunset was down to a faintly glowing ember in the west, the moon rose in the east, I went forth on my bicycle. I coasted in the club. Festooned with Cantonese lanterns, the ball in the distance looked like a cruise ship at sea. I could not identify individuals, only stirrings of color. Much of it was powder blue. The day after Wayne Parr said that he had chosen powder blue for his dinner jacket, three quarters of the boys ordered the same jacket from Tuxedo Junction. Back and forth I cruised in the night beyond the lights. Music reached my ears at random peeps. The desert flowers, so abundant in April, were dying now. I had the notion that they were calling to each other. I cruised for hours. The moon rose into the sky like a lost balloon. Somewhere in the dark, shapes of the maricopas, a coyote howled. In the days and weeks and years that followed, everyone agreed. They'd never seen anything like it. She arrived in a bicycle sidecar, just big enough for her to sit in. The sidecar had a single outboard wheel, and the inboard side was braced to the bike. Everything but the seat of the bike and the sidecar bench was covered in flowers. A ten-foot blanket of flowers trailed the rear fender like a bridal train. Palm fronds flared from the handlebars. It looked like a float in the rose parade. Dory Dilson pedaled the bicycle. Eyewitnesses later filled in what I could not see. Parents, cameras flashing, floodlight, making a second day as gorgeous couples disembarked from limos and borrowed convertibles and promenade to the festive courts. Showers of applause. Suddenly the flashing stops. The floodlights dim. A hush falls over the crowd as a particularly long white limo rolls away from the entrance. Here comes this three-wheeled bouquet. The driver, Dory Dilson, wears a tailed white tuxedo and tall silk hat, but at, it's her passenger who rivets the crowd. Her strapless gown is a bright, rich yellow as, it, as if pressed from buttercups. There must be one of those hooped contraptions underneath, for the skirt billows outward from her waist like an upside-down teacup. Her hair is incredible. <clears throat> Descriptions classed, clash. Some say it's the color of honey. Some say strawberries. It fluffs like meringue high upon her head. It's a wig. No, it's all hers. But both sides are uncertain. Earrings dangle. They are little silver somethings. But what? They're partly obscured by falling ringlets. Many answers are offered, but the most popular is monopoly pieces. But this will prove to be wrong. From a rawhide string around her neck dangles a white, inch-long, banana-shaped fossil, identifying her as a member in good standing of the loyal order of the stone bone. While others wear orchids, the corsage on her wrist is a small sunflower, or a huge black-eyed Susan, or some side sort of daisy. No one's sure, except that the colors are yellow and black. Before proceeding, she turns back to the bicycle and bends over a small basket hanging from the handlebars. The basket, too, is covered with flowers. She appears to kiss something inside of it. Then she waves to Dory Dilson. Dory salutes, and the bicycle pulls away. People nearby catch a glimpse of tiny cinnamon-colored ears and two peppercorn eyes peering out of the basket. Beautiful. Unusual. Interesting. Different. Regal. These words were come from parents lingering the walk. For now, there are only stairs as she makes her way from the entrance to the ball. Someone recalls a single camera flashing, but that's all. She's no one's child. She's the girl they have heard about. As she passes by, she makes no attempt to avoid their eyes. On the contrary, she looks directly at them, turning t to one side and then the other, looking into their eyes and smiling as if she knows she knows them as if they have shared grand and special things. Some turn aside uneasy in a way that they cannot account for. Others suddenly feel empathy, empty when she 
or when her eyes leave theirs. So distracting, so complete is she that she is gone before many realize that she had no escort. She was alone, a parade of one. Perched on my bike in the distance, I remember looking up and seeing the torrent of stars we call the Milky Way. I remember wondering if she could see them too, or were they lost in the light of the lanterns? The dancing took place on the center tennis court, which had been covered with a portable parquet floor. She did what everyone else did at the ball. She danced. To the music of Guy Greco and the serenaders, she danced the slow dances and the fast ones. She spread her arms wide and threw back her head and closed her eyes and gave every impression of thoroughly enjoying herself. They did not speak to her, of course, but they could not help looking over the shoulders of their dates. She clapped at the end of each number. She's alone, they kept telling themselves, and surely she's danced in no one's arms, yet somehow that seemed to matter less and less. As the night went on and clarinet and coyote call mingled beyond the lantern light, the magic of their own powder blue jackets and orchids seemed to fade, and it came to them in small sensations that they were more alone than she was. Who was the first to crack? To crack, no one knows. Did someone <laughs> brush against her at the punch table, pluck a petal from her flower, because one was missing, whisper, hi, this much is certain, a boy named Raymond Studemaker danced with her. To the student body at large, Raymond Studemaker did not have enough substance to trigger the opening of a supermarket door. He belonged to no team or organization. He took part in no school activities. His grades were ordinary. His clothing was ordinary. His face was ordinary. He had no detectable personality. Thin as a minute, he appeared to lack the heft to carry his own name. And in fact, when all eyes turned on him and the dance floor, those few who came up with a name for him frowned at his white jacket and whispered, oh, Raymond something? Yet there he was, Raymond something, walking right up to her. It came out later that his date had suggested it, and speaking to her, and then they were dancing. Couples steered themselves to get a better look. <clears throat> At the end of the number, he joined her in clapping and returned to his date. He told her that the silver earrings looked like little trucks. Tension rose, boys got antsy, girls picked at their corsages, and the ice shattered. Several boys bo broke from their dates, and they were heading her way when she walked up to Guy Greco and said something to him. Guy Greco turned to the serenaders, and the baton flashed, and out came the sounds of the old teen dance standard, the bunny hop. Within seconds, a long line was snaking across the floor. Stargirl led the way, and suddenly it was December again, and she had the whole school in her spell. Almost every couple joined in. Hillary Kimball and Wayne Parr did not. The line curled back and forth across the netless tennis courts. Stargirl began to improv improvise. She flung her arms to a make-believe crowd like a celebrity on parade. She waggled her fingers at the stars. She churned her fists like an egg beater. Every action echoed down the line behind her. The three hops of the bunny became the three struts of a vaudeville vamp, then a penguin waddle, then a tippy-toed priss. Every new move brought new laughter from the line. When Guy Greco ended the music, howls of protest greeted him, so he restruck the downbeat. To the delighted squeals, Stargirl led them off the parquet dance floor and onto the other courts and then through the chain link fence and off the tennis courts altogether. Red carnations and wrist corsages flashed as the line headed out onto the practice putting green of the golf course. The line doodled around the holes, in and out of the side pools of lantern light. From the dance floor, it seemed to be more than it was. 100 couples, 200 people, 400 dancing legs seemed to be a single festive flowery creature, a fabulous millipede. And then there was less and less to see as the head vanished and the rest curled through the fringe of light and followed like the tail of a powder blue dragon into the darkness. One girl in chiffon had a tiff with her date and ran off toward the first tee calling, wait for me. She looked like a huge mint green moth. 
Their voices came in clearly from the golf course. Their laughing and yelping made a raucous counterpoint to the metronomic talk, talk, talk of the bunny's never-ending hop. Once in the light of the quarter moon, they appeared in the silhouette on a doomed distant green, or a domed distant green, like figures dancing in someone's dream. And then, quite suddenly, they were gone, as if the dreamer had awakened. Nothing to see, nothing to hear. Someone called, hey, after them. But that was all. It was, according to those left behind, like waiting for a diver to return to the surface. Hillary Kimball, for one, did not share that feeling. I came here to dance, she declared, and she pulled Wayne Parr along the bandstand and demanded regular music. Guy Greco tilted his head to listen, but the baton did not stop, and neither did the band. In fact, the minutes went by, the music seemed to become louder. Maybe it was an illusion, or maybe the band felt a connection to the dancers. Maybe the farther the line spun into the night, the louder the band had to play. Maybe the music was a tether or a kite string. Hillary Kimball dragged Wayne Parr out into the middle of the parquet floor, and they slow danced, they fast danced. They even tried an old-fashioned jitterbug, but nothing worked. Nothing went with the triple-thumping drumbeat of the bunny hop itself. Hillary's orchid shed petals as she beat her fist on Wayne Parr's chest. Do something, she yelled and she ripped sticks of chewing gum from his pocket. She chewed them furiously, and she spit the wad and pressed the gum into her ears. The band played on. Afterward, there were many different guesses as to how long the bunny hoppers were actually gone. Everyone agreed it seemed to be hours. Students stood under the last line of lanterns with their fingers <clears throat> curling through the plastic-coated wire of the fence, peering into the vast blackness, straining for a glimpse, a scrap of sound. All they heard was the call of the coyote. A boy dashed wildly into the darkness, and he sauntered back, his blue jacket over his shoulder, laughing. A gl girl with glitter in her hair shivered. Her bare shoulders shook as if she were cold, and she began to cry. Hillary Kimball stalked along the fence, clenching and unclenching her fists. She could not seem to stand still, and when the call finally came, they're back. It was from a lone watcher at the far end. A hundred kids, only Hillary Kimball stayed behind, turned and raced down the eight tennis courts, pastel skirts flapping like stampeding flamingos. The fence buckled outward as they slammed into it. They strained to see. Lights barely trickled over the crusted earth beyond the fence. This was the desert side. Where? Where? Then you could hear whoops and yahoos and there, somewhere, clashing with the music. And then, there, a flash of yellow, star girl leaping from the shadows. The rest followed out of the darkness, a long, powder blue, many-headed birthing. Hop, hop, hop. They were still smack on the beat. If anything, they were more energized than before. They were fresh, their eyes sparkling in the light. Many of the girls wore browning, half-dead flowers in their hair. Stargirl led them along outside the fence. Those inside got up their own line and hopped along. Guy Greco struck the downbeat three final times. Hop, hop, hop. And the two lines collided at the gate in a frenzy of hugs and shrieks and kisses. Shortly after, as the serenaders gratefully played Stardust, Hillary Kimball walked up to Stargirl and said, you ruin everything, and she slapped her. The crowd grew instantly still, and the two girls stood facing each other for a long minute. Those nearby saw in Hillary's shoulders and eyes a flinching. She was waiting to be struck in return. And in fact, when Stargirl finally moved, Hillary winced and shut her eyes. But it was lips that touched her, not the palm of a, of a hand. Stargirl kissed her gently on the cheek. She was gone by the time that Hillary opened her eyes. Dory Dilson was waiting. Stargirl seemed to float down the promenade in her buttercup gown. She climbed into the sidecar, and the flowered bicycle rolled off into the night. And that was the last any of us ever saw of Stargirl. That's the end of chapter 31. Thanks, guys. See you next time.